Uh, so can we go ahead and have the, the entire panel come on up now? Uh, we'll do the introductions once everybody's up here. I took it as a very good sign that we had, I think we need one more. Do you want me to stand? I think take a very good sign that for this panel, uh, we had this many uh, participants from such a wide range of industries. Um, do you want me to run this? Or? So I'm not going to do this. Yeah. Okay. All right, so en enough about me. Uh, uh, as Laura said, I'm a data science expert in residence here um, and also uh, associate dean for innovation in the East College of Business. Um, what we're going to do is just step through the, the panel. Uh, the, the main point of this panel really is to sort of talk about the data life cycle uh, in, in ag uh, and to think about opportunities for either startups or, or funding opportunities in this space. I think it's a very rich space. Uh, I think data is touching everywhere. I think people are becoming more and more familiar with this, this idea that, that data really is everywhere and has incredible potential. Uh, and there's a lot of opportunities to, to develop new products or new uh, companies around that. I think the Agrable was a great example of, of that, really, of, of taking data and making it available in a way that might be more useful to, to the end, end, end user, the grower. Uh, so what I want to do now is we're just going to step through. We're going to give each of the, the panels, I'll, I'll, I'll introduce them here. The, the slides will also be up there. But I want them to talk a little bit about uh, what they see their role, their company's role in this digital ag space. Uh, and then after that, there will be some questions that I'll be seeding. But again, uh, we want to open this up to questions from the audience. Uh, as a professor, I will have absolutely no problem calling on people, uh, perhaps randomly. So you should think proactively what you might want to ask. Uh, if you have questions. So first we're going to go ahead and start with Eric Bernard from Granular. Yes, yeah, so uh, my name is Eric Barnard. I'm a director of engineering at Granular. Uh, we have offices here in uh, Champaign-Urbana, actually just right across the parking lot, uh, as well as our headquarters in San Francisco and offices in Des Moines, Iowa. Uh, as a director of engineering at Granular, um, my specific focus is in our Granular business. Uh, software suite, that is what most of us would probably refer to as a farm management software or FMS product. Um, but with that, we marry up a uh, collection of actual data, you know, uh, machine data coming from tractors and, and different pieces of equipment, and try to bring that into financial decision making uh, and decision support. So that's the area I tend to focus on, but also have a hand in a lot of the other uh, work that we're doing as a company to make uh, making farming more efficient uh, for our, our, our customers, the growers that are out here in, in the Midwest and, and across the country. All right, thank you. So next we have, this is in, in alphabetical order, uh, is Lance Brown uh, from Agco. My name is, uh, excuse me, Lance Brown. I'm the uh, Global Learning and Development Director uh, for Agco Green and Protein. Um, what's probably uh, interesting for this group is that what started out as a training uh, project of how we could use uh, digital tools to do a better job of, of training has now uh, turned into a, uh, a project on augmented and mixed reality and how we can use our internal uh, digital tools and the data that we're collecting um, from our protein controllers or our grain monitoring systems uh, to help uh, our internal teams, our dealer network, and our customers visualize their digital and data uh, tools in the environments that they are currently working in. And so being able to overlay those digital uh, machines or the data in their real world environments using augmented reality. And uh, we're utilizing the, uh, the talent, uh, the students here at the University of Champaign to help us uh, push augmented mixed reality in that. I, I will definitely say we're going to want to touch back on that. Um, that's that sounded very interesting. Uh, so third, we have Chris, Chris Dempsey from Case IH. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, so I'm responsible for within within the Case IH family, we have our technology platform, which is Advanced Farming Systems. So I'm responsible for product marketing for a portion of our, our technology products within that. Um, from an OEM standpoint, as we talk about data, uh, our focus is, is really on the collection of data and the evolution of the technology that goes into the collection of it, as well as then transferring it to some of these third parties that, that our customers work so closely with. Um, 
part of my position as well is kind of directing our product development and strategic acquisition teams into looking at uh, emerging technologies that our customers see benefits in moving forward. All right, great, thanks, Chris. Uh, next, we have Kelly Gillespie from Bayer. Excellent, thank you very much. Um, so, Kelly Gillespie, I actually maybe have a, a unique perspective compared to um, maybe other people on this panel or perspectives that we've heard yet today. So, my team is actually um, an internal R&D innovation team. Um, so we think about the, a lot of the ag tech that we're talking about here today, and how do we apply that to our R&D pipeline? How are we thinking about being more efficient with our, our, our pipeline, our, our nurseries, um, our testing, our agronomics, um, really in order to, to test as many things as possible with as few well, dollars, resources, um, as we can in order to um, really just deliver the best products um, at the end of our pipeline to farmers. Great. All right, next is Robert Lubin from Rabo. Yep. Hello, hi, um, yeah, Robert Lubin, I'm a digital ag for North America on the uh, farm financing side for Rabo Bank. Um, and the bank um, is exclus exclusively focused on food and ag in about 40 countries around the world, um, in addition to being the largest retail bank in the Netherlands. Um, and so we're focused on bringing our data together along with a lot of other external data across the full, full uh, value chain in agriculture um, and how we, in my area, then how can we can help producers um, realize better financial outcomes. Great. Next is Chinmay Soman uh, from EarthSense. Hello, uh, I'm Chinmay Soman, uh, co-founder and CEO of EarthSense. Uh, we're doing some exciting things in robotics and machine learning for agriculture, specifically focusing on uh, removing the bottleneck on data and actionable information from underneath the canopy. Uh, in terms of applications, we are starting to work primarily with uh, large seed companies and cutting edge uh, research crop scientists to help them uh, make the next generation of more productive, more sustainable crops uh, faster and cheaper and better. Uh, but over time, these technologies, uh, you know, we're actively working on transitioning these technologies to help uh, growers uh, scout their fields better so that they can take more profitable and more, uh, you know, yield enhancing actions during the season. Uh, and then eventually we envision our robots uh, working together with other technologies existing on the field uh, to solve problems like uh, herbicide resistant weeds. Which, which is an incredibly challenging problem and getting worse. Uh, and then uh, last but not least, we have Rebecca Stay from Cargill. Sure. Hi everyone, I'm a data science leader at Cargill. Uh, as part of that, we are a central group and so we apply data science across all of Cargill, which means we apply data science across all of the food supply chain. Uh, one of the things that we are really focused on is trying to uh, get data off of uh, places where it's a little bit harder, right? So we have a lot of internal systems where it's easy, but if you think about the farms, uh, trying to get data in a consistent way off of that uh, has been interesting for us, and so we work a lot with the team at Cargo where they put a lot of sensors. So whether that's in chicken coops, farms, uh, shrimp ponds, uh, we do a lot of that, and then we'll apply our data science to uh, where we can put the Collecting the data itself gives insights to the farmers, but then we also use data science to help them make better decisions and help them predict uh, so that they can be more uh, prosperous. The other thing that Cargill is looking at a lot today is how can we apply some of the AI, some of the data that we have into sustainability, because this has become so important, uh, as, as it has been mentioned a couple of times today, uh, the growing population and then the need to provide a sustainable food source for that. Great. Uh, so, so one of the things when you, when you approach such a large, complex task um, like data, and in particular data in ag tech, is to try to break it up and, and think about a way to sort of uh, bring things together in a way that might make a little bit of sense. So uh, uh, we had a, a meeting uh, of the panelists, uh, and, and sort of we thought about breaking up this topic and, and just thinking about the data life cycle. So the first step was always data acquisition. Uh, and so we're going to throw out a question here around data acquisition. Um, and I think I'll go uh, first to Chris, because I know uh, that's one of the big things that, that uh, he was focusing on, but others should, should feel to follow up. And that is, what are some of the challenges uh, around data acquisition that maybe aren't obvious to, to people that are sort of outside the, the field? Sure, no, it's a good question. Um, you know, as an OEM, we look at 
at being the originator of the data, whether that is a yield monitor on a combine, uh, planning simulation population, those types of things. And one of the, the pieces that gets overlooked is that's really the starting point. It's junk in, junk out, right? If, if these guys don't have accurate data to make actionable uh, actions with and actionable decisions with, it, it doesn't go anywhere. So when we look at technologies that decrease complexities of calibrations, again, whether that's yield monitor or whatever you, you have, you decrease the chance for error in the data that, that you produce, and your downstream result is much more accurate and much more actionable. Um, let's see here, I thought, uh, um, Kelly, you might have a follow-on because you have to do a lot of that with Bayer. We do, in fact. Um, but I'm going to, so, so I am representing Bayer, but um, our partner, well, our, our, the other company I'm semi-representing is Climate Corporation. And there's an interesting example um, that they've just launched with their um, application that I think speaks to some of the yield monitor um, challenges and calibration. So what they've just... Um, launched, I guess is the right word, is a way for the way tickets to be inputted into the field view um, software. Mm -hmm. And then that way, right, the, the variation across the field remains the same, but the way ticket um, from that, that, you know, truck of grain that was taken to the elevator can then be used as a sort of secondary point of calibration on some of the data. And so I think any place where we can use, you know, checks and balances in that way, either with internal R&D data or, you know, with external data as it's coming in, and, and in the case of Climate Corporation, um, you know, I think that helps um, as well. Yeah. So one of the key things about agriculture and data is that there is a massive cost to data collection, especially if you want to collect it at the right place at the right time, right? So the large equipment that's well instrumented, whenever you're doing field operations, you get some data coming off, but that may not be when you want the data, right? So yield monitors are an excellent source of data about the yield, but what happened uh, throughout the season to lead to that yield, right? We don't really know. So there are a lot of these holes, and, uh, you know, for example, and it goes all the way through the value chain. Bayer, for example, invests in a lot of, like, high school and college students to walk their breeding fields and collect data during the growing season because they need to know a lot of times a uh, lot of time points, what's happening on that field, right? And, uh, you know, UAVs were one of the big hopes, but unfortunately they're not a complete solution or nearly a complete solution. Uh, there's a lot of stuff happening underneath the canopy, uh, which is one, some of the most interesting stuff. And uh, that's what you need to know. And bringing down the cost of collecting that data is one of the biggest challenges in breeding or research or production. Actually, real quick to follow on to that, because you mentioned Bayer. Uh, what's, what's interesting, too, in I really like the, the opening statement about how, you know, we've thought about data in terms of information and then, um, sorry, data, information, knowledge, and wisdom, right? And how, how computers today and AI models are sort of bridging that knowledge gap right now. And so what we've done in the past in breeding and, and in R&D generally is that you need to know what specific question is or what specific type of data you need in order to get to the answer, right? But I think this AI and, and really the revolution that's coming is you don't have to know what that is. You know, you can collect any, any and all kind of data and let the model help determine what the important sort of attributes are that you're looking for. And so that is something that we're, it, it's, it's a different mindset from an R&D perspective, um, but we're, we're making that transition. I think one of the other great challenges still, um, and less so in the large-scale agriculture, but for much of um, fruit and vegetable production in this country, um, it's still manual labor, and you have a crew leader who's starting a timer for a crew doing work in a field, and you think there's very little from uh, spraying. It's all, again, people entering data and phones. So I think with wearables and other technologies coming and more and more, you know, the workers having mobile devices, there's a tremendous opportunity there to think about automating data collection and those higher value crops. I would say from a collection standpoint, uh, you've got the different OEMs providing uh, data, but one of the challenges that we have to deal with on a daily basis is the differentiation across OEMs in trying to aggregate that data to drive decisions. Uh, you know, dealing not just with AFS, DEER, um, and, and the various other uh, data sources out there, but the versions within those different manufacturers 
is mind numbing. And it takes a lot of manpower to get that even close to right. Uh, and then to tack on top of that, the data quality. Uh, we talked a little bit about this, but if a yield monitor is telling us one yield and that's off by five bushels, well, on a field of corn, that may be great for still making an operational decision for the next year, but it's actually very bad for a business decision because now your financials have been significantly skewed. So uh, that's something that we have to deal with. You, you also mentioned the, the, uh, the fruit and vegetable growers, the specialty crops, lots of manual labor there. Um, this is where cell connectivity and just the general infrastructure of our rural areas really impacts things. You can't get data about a field or an operation if that data never actually makes it back to your servers. Uh, that's something we struggle with a lot. You know, we have growers that, hey, this, this field isn't right. We, n we never got anything. Is that phone ever even brought to within a, a Wi-Fi network? Something that we, we still see. Yeah, that, that's kind of that, that discussion was earlier today about the Silicon Valley versus the farmer, right? That, that things may work seamlessly in Silicon Valley. And, uh, you know, problems that happen on the farm don't even, don't even come into their, to their minds. I think we're back together. I was just going to say very quickly, we've uh, packed up hard drives from farms in <laughs> Canada, right, and shipped them to us, uh, knowing that that's not scalable, but it's a place to start. Yeah. So I think we've, we've sort of have, have really touched on a lot of topics in the data acquisition. Um, and, and I'm sitting here thinking, hopefully others in the audience are as well, there were a lot of opportunities and pain points. And anytime you hear pain points from companies, you should see opportunity, right? I mean, we had to mention about uh, just getting the, the data off. Then we had, well, there's secondary ways of trying to calibrate, and, and we know the importance of calibration. Uh, and then, Chibi, you were making the point about the different types of data and when are you getting the data. There may be value in trying to get these data at different times. Uh, I think there's, there's some interesting conversations that we could all have off of that, but I, I want to pick up what Eric was talking about there at the end, which was really more of the data cleaning, which is sort of the second step. Let's just say we got all the data we want. All right, we're, we're just going to make that assumption. Uh, and now we have all this different data, and as a simple example, you have data off of a tractor from one vendor and data off a tractor from another vendor. How do you even start making sense of that or even different versions of software off the same vendor? So what are some issues or some pain points that people have, have seen there and, and maybe potential solutions or things they, they realize that are in this space? Yeah, I can, I can start with that. Not to pick on you as a OEM. Yeah, no, that's, that's fair. Um, so proprietary data up until very recently was, was a very real issue that we dealt with, whether it was us or, or any of the other major OEMs. Um, we, as well as many third parties, and I would encourage you all as, as people looking at emerging technologies, is to follow more of a a data standardization, right, whether it's an ISO standard. Um, so that's one of the things that, that we are working on on putting, implementing is, is exporting data not only in, in a proprietary format, but also in a, an ISO format that allows numerous different platforms to work with it. It allows it to be much more transferable. Um, we're also working um, with what's called an ADAPT system, which, which takes in these, these different mixed fleet data sources and converts them all into a common um, form of data, which allows us to much more easily transfer that to our third party partners. So I think we're taking steps in the right direction to make that much more feasible and hopefully you guys are seeing that uh, from your side as well. Does anyone have yeah, I think one of the challenges that we have is with that data cleaning is that you have different people wanting different types of data. So like in livestock production, you may have a integrator that wants a certain type of data. You may have, you know, uh, a farm owner that needs a different group of data. And then you may have the actual barn manager that needs something different. And so how do you create a, that platform? Or uh, is it a shared tool? Is it different tools? How to distribute the data the different people within that entire uh, production chain need to make the, the well-educated decisions. And from an OEM standpoint, that can get challenging on, okay, you know, who's paying for what and how do we collect it and what data do we actually collect? Um, and then how do you clean it so it can actually be usable? Is that, is that just at the app level for different users to see different subsets of the overall data, or is that a fundamentally different thing? Uh, 
Like, so, so, so Agco has a, a bunch of data that's been collected, yep. and so you have the different you, types of users. Do they simply need a different view, or like, like they're all using the same app, and it just provides the data in a different viewpoint, or is this actually, no, this is a different way we have to manage the data set? Uh, I think, at least on the grain and protein side, we're still trying to figure that out a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, we'd like to have one app, but as... Um, you know, some of these large integrators may not be all, uh, you know, may not use all of our equipment. And so they may have their own system, then we need to feed via an API. And so managing and figuring all that out is, I think, still something we're uh, trying to come up with our strategy on the best way to do that. I think we identified another pain point. Yeah. Right, yeah. Um, does anybody have a, not, not that, any of you would have horror stories about data cleaning uh, from your own companies, but, but uh, you know, uh, urban legends or farm legends about cleaning data that you might be able to share? Yeah, I mean, I grew up on a farm just over in Indiana. We still currently farm. Like, you, you have the horror stories of, uh, I just, you know, I just had sent off all my yield data from last year, got my yield mass back, bought all my seed, have my, my plans put in place, and then you find out, yeah, my my monitor is off by 10 bushels. You know, the classic calibration story. Mm -hmm. uh, you also have, you know, the, the same thing from service providers. Hey, we put, you know, 150 pounds an acre down, but you come to find out it was, they missed an entire chunk of the field, right? It, it's, um, you kind of brought up like the data cleaning aspect. I think there's a good definition around what is clean data. Is it data that is uh, representative of of consistent, you know, uh, believable numbers. And then there is the level of like, no, the grower actually has ground truth those and confirm that those are accurate. And that's where we kind of come back and think there's, there has to be a bigger motivation. If a motivation for the grower to get accurate data is simply to make year after year operational decisions, that it maybe isn't a high enough motivation to ensure that the data is of the utmost accuracy. We feel like you need to provide the ability to support their financial decisions to get them to really ground truth that and ensure that it's of the utmost quality. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it's quite a horror story or not. You guys can judge. Um, but one of the challenges that we have in R&D is thinking about data at different scales. You know, so you think about linking genetic data, which is, you know, the genetics of a seed is the genetics of a seed regardless, right? And then you plant that seed in a certain year, and so the metadata starts to matter. What fields were they? What was the weather that year? What was the in-season data like? Um, you know, and then you have an aggregate data like yield at the end of the year, which, which you know, takes all of that into consideration. And you start to try to put those things together to make better decisions, and all of a sudden the metadata and, and sort of the scale at which you're working really starts to matter um, a lot more than well, than it did before. <laughs> and so, so that's sort of one of the pain points and challenges is, that we're working through is not only do you need to collect the data, but you also need to then collect the metadata in terms of, you know, management and densities and, um, you know, farmer practices and all those, all those things start to matter um, when, you're, when you're making more and more accurate decisions um, in, in the end. And so, mm -hmm. opportunity. <laughs> do, do, you see this, do you see this as an issue um, mostly driven by people wanting to ask questions of the data? and then realizing the data is not rich enough or the metadata is not well enough established? Um, or is it something that can be done better ahead of time? Probably both. Mm -hmm. So I think it is driven by people, certainly it is driven by people asking questions and then you, know, you kind of do a POC analysis or you do an analysis in a single year and it looks great. You know, and, you, and you have an answer or you have a direction or, or a decision that you think you want to make and you say, okay, but let's repeat it you know, or let's do a bigger scale experiment and it doesn't work, mm -hmm. right? And so then it starts to become obvious that, well, okay, you, you know, there's, a, there's a, a, at least one factor, if not multiple factors that we're not taking into account here and how do we you know, backtrack and figure out what that factor could have been, um, you know, and then you realize you didn't collect something that could have been important, right? And so then that's sort of a, well, test, fail, learn <laughs> sort of cycle, which is great, but um, is definitely a challenge. Yeah, I would echo that. Uh, basically, Agriculture is an incredibly complex system at all scales, from breeding all the way to production to you know, animal operations. And there's no way, like, we're not even there where we know what we don't know. Uh, there's lots of unknown unknowns, so we're trying as fast as we can to generate more and more high resolution, highly accurate, timely data. And in the near future, it's only going to tell us 
a little bit more about what else we need to collect data about. Mm -hmm. So it's that kind of a regime that we're in, but hopefully, you know, before too long, uh, with sort of better data collection tools, as well as better AI tools that are more robust to these kinds of like large uncertainties and large holes in our knowledge base, uh, we'll get there. So, but that's the kind of technological innovation that's needed. I'm going to have to admit I was a little disappointed nobody on the panel picked up on the pun of cleaning and agriculture and it being a, 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 an unpleasant thing. Uh, but we'll, we'll move on. Uh, so, so the next step really is management, but I'm going to go ahead and, and, and skip that because we've had a lot of discussion now about AI and learning from the data and sort of those sort of goals. Obviously, this is an important point, right? I mean, this is sort of the value add that we really are trying to get at here, that we have this data and that we can extract that knowledge or the wisdom uh, as, the, as the pyramid sort of showed. Uh, so, so what are some examples that you might want to be able to share from your background? Um, and, and Rebecca, if we haven't ta heard from you uh, recently, do you want to start off talking about maybe some of the, the benefits you've seen with AI and ML, uh, sort of that more analytics, uh, analytics aspect of the data science? Sure, absolutely. Uh, so as I mentioned, as the data science team, uh, we look across Cargill, right? So we've seen advantages um, from a uh, demand forecasting, uh, right? So if you think of cargo, right, we're the food supply chain, right? And so we try and optimize across that. And if you can take one more step forward, that becomes demand forecasting. Sometimes that's used internally. We also work with our customers to help them with demand forecasting. They see value out of it. We see value out of it. Uh, we also do a lot of trading analytics uh, to try and give insight to our traders so that they can make better decisions. Uh, we use a lot of computer vision. We do customer analytics. Uh, we are still a business, and so we are always trying to find better ways uh, to reach our customers and provide them with the right opportunity at the right time. Uh, we also have geospatial modeling, and so getting back a little bit to the data, uh, having folks that can understand what map data looks like or what computer vision data looks like or what social network data looks like. Uh, we can also use that type of data into our models. Um, and then we have, as I mentioned before, we have products that we actually sell out to our customers. And so we're trying to expand those AI products, both things that we provide internally to other Cargill employees to help them do their job better, but then also to our customers and to the farmers on, on and, and our, the, our customers, users on the other side of the supply chain. Mm -hmm. How about you, Robert? Do you want to share any thoughts in terms of the, uh, the finance aspect? Yeah, it's something, uh, the bank's fairly advanced in the Netherlands uh, with a fairly large data science team uh, at the retail end with doing a lot of predictive analytics for product development. Um, on the, the food and ag side, we're really literally just starting to have those discussions with those data science teams with the data sources that we have um, to start to explore. You know, an area for us is really around um, benchmarking and uh, how, do we, how do we better enable our clients to be better managers of their business um, and looking at that all across the world. So, you know, clients in Australia, they care around what are the economics in the Black Sea region or the U.S. They know they're competing at the margin if you're a wheat producer in those markets. So how do we help them gain better operational insights into their business, and how does that translate into financial insights? And that's some of what we're just starting to work on. Okay. Anything else? So one of the, one of the questions when we're, we're preparing students for uh, their future careers, and we're particularly in the analytics realm, uh, and hopefully some of you can, can maybe answer this, is what are the things that they really should be learning? Right? I mean, the, the latest and greatest is, of course, you know, deep learning. And, and we're throwing, you know, lots of data and, and you're beating chess or you're beating the latest game. Uh, is that really where we need students to be coming out? Or is it really still more of the sort of standard algorithms, maybe even logistic regression, linear regression, things that have been around for, for, for decades? Um, or is it somewhere in between? Or is it, is it all of the above? Uh, what are some of your experiences so that our students, oops, sorry, our students out here will be... Uh, know what they should listen to in lecture. I could maybe start. I mean, well, so mine's actually not going to be a technical answer because I would actually say in order to, to get a job in industry or, or to have an impact, you know, being a technical expert in your area is table stakes. Um, that's, that's really what gets you in the door. What, gets, what, what allows you to succeed is your ability to communicate succinctly 
So how do I translate my understanding, or well, I don't actually have this understanding, but your understanding of you know, deep learning and machine learning and AI to someone who has a physiologist background or who has a breeding background, and how are we partnering and how are we you know, thinking about adjacent spaces for the work that we're doing? Um, you know, so I may not have an understanding of operations, but I need to partner with somebody who has an understanding of operations in order to you know, make this model successful. And so I would say that communication piece and that really I think it's, it's actually sort of a, a, a study in humility as well, um, that it, it takes a group of people, it takes a, a, it takes a village to make this, to get this over mm -hmm. the finish line. I guess from our standpoint, um, in terms of data analytics, I think the next big step that, that we're going to see is an expansion of predictive analytics. Mm -hmm. So we're starting to see all this data come in. And, and what do we do with it, right? It's one thing to have it, but, but how does it benefit us? How does it benefit our customers? And from an OEM standpoint, my products, looking at the data that we have coming in and starting to, pr to predict failure modes. I think that's really where probably our next big push is going to be. And so any background that, that you have that feeds into that would be extremely beneficial. Yeah, I, I would echo what he said. Working with engineers on a daily basis and data scientists, um, I've, I've seen a lot of folks come in that are eager to spin up a TensorFlow setup or, you know, they, they're very, sent, very focused on what technology they'll get to play with. And what I always encourage them is understand the business. Like, see what the value the business is trying to bring to customers and how can you enhance that. If you can do that, like, I, I agree with you, Technical expertise is table stakes. Being able to tell the organization, you don't have to have a, a team of product managers, you know, babysitting you on a daily basis to make sure that you're doing what is valuable is, is where you're really going to shine in the organization. If you can see where that value is and, and go straight for it, that's, that's the type of thing that's going to accelerate your career. So I can just give the cargo perspective on hiring data scientists, right? So we look for people that have technical skills. Uh, somewhat broad, but also we want to see some depth in one or two areas. And when we interview, we really go back to sort of the basics to start with, right? Like we ask about, well, what do you think about the curse of dimensionality? And how do you think about feature engineering? And what about bias versus various, uh, variance? What type of models do you like to use, right? And we start to get into uh, having them explain to us some of the very basics when it comes to data science, because it's important that you understand that before you can use the TensorFlow, right? And exactly what, I apologize, at the very beginning, what he said, right, is that there are a lot of different technologies, right? And nobody can be an expert in all of them. Uh, we do expect you to be an expert in one or two of them. And I often get asked the question from students, too, is, well, what should I be learning next? What's going to be the next big thing? Um, and that is, of course, very hard to predict, even for a data scientist. Um, and so what I always tell people is, like, be curious, right? Uh, sort of understand what that new algorithm type is or what that new technology is and understand how it can help you in the problems that you want to solve. So it's that and the communication, of course, is what we look for. So, so you've led naturally into the last part of the data life cycle, and that is the storytelling, the communication, the exp explanation of what, it, what the value add here is. Um, and so I want to follow up. I know uh, Lance has, has, has a, a great story on, on the AR, the using the uh, new modes of communication to sort of help bring down the barrier, that technological barrier, um, that maybe it's difficult to explain how that predictive al algorithm works, but when you can show the application to somebody, that has to be very powerful. Yeah, definitely. Uh, you know, our story started with, you know, our equipment is not movable. So trying to do training on it, uh, either was extremely expensive or near impossible. What we found out really quickly is that from, uh, you know, we're looking, our customers are often building million, two million dollar swine barns or grain storage facilities, and they oftentimes have a hard trouble visualizing what that's going to look like on their farm. And so being able to use existing 3D digital tools that we had to be able to help them do that uh, was extremely powerful and is been very successful for us. Once that got into place, we're like, well, we've got this digital twin. How can we start thinking about bringing data into different pieces of that digital twin? So when you have the you know, labor uh, challenges that we're facing, can we not need the specialized labor, but 
maybe mechanical expertise and then provide digital tools, 3D images or 3D data on the actual site where they need it. And so not having to be uh, looking at a tablet or stuck behind a computer to get that data, having that data in essence floating right next to there so they can make that decision in their real world at the real time. And so, you know, it's in terms of things we're looking for in our students is, okay, we can create the data, we've got great data sets, we've got great data scientists that are generating it. How do we deliver it in a way that the producer, the farm laborer, the integrator can use it to make decisions right away and make the best decisions? And so that's where we think the augmented or the mixed reality where we can overlay that on a real world or inside the, swan, the pig barn or 50 feet up in the air on a, a grain conveyor uh, has some real power um, and some real cool possibilities moving forward. Anyone else have any? Doesn't have to be mixed reality. Yeah. <laughs> but communication is important. Anyone have any thoughts on, on that? I think, I, again, from, from our standpoint, um, my background was heavily support and service before this, and we look at the implementation of, of augmented and mixed reality and things like Google Glass, uh, the efficiencies that those types of products bring to, we focus a lot on customer-centric products. Um, there's, there's three main companies in here that have a very large dealer network as well. And how can these products increase the efficiency of our dealer techs? Uh, being able to see things like service manuals or torque specs in real time through products like augmented reality or Google, Gla Google Glass offers infinite possibility. Yeah, and, and Agco on the implement side has been using Google Glass uh, in their factories to ensure that we're providing the highest quality products. Um, and so, and delivering training uh, so the people in our factories are, you know, trained quicker, faster, and providing the highest quality product uh, to our dealers and to uh, producers. And so there's all sorts of really, really cool uh, applications, but, you know, benefits all down the value chain by using, at least in my opinion, these new uh, visual, what I like to call visual technologies, or how do we, you know, visualize these digital tools, again, in our real world environments. I think for us at Granular, we always try to bring it back to the pocketbook. Uh, I think we have found that that's tremendously impactful to our end customer to see how these tools can can make you a, a better business person. Um, we we rolled out a couple years ago a feature that allows uh, growers to see, given the the long term predicted uh, yield of their fields, like which fields are they renting that are, they're they're losing money on in the long run. You know, we we would often get feedback. Well, I made money on that field last year. No, you, you just happened to catch a blip in the market, and you got lucky. But in your long term vision. This really is not something valuable for you to continue renewing that contract on. And that's been very, very interesting to have those types of conversations with growers. Um, and we, we have uh, continued to focus on that. You can go into Deer's Op Center and use our profit maps tool today to look and see, are there parts of the, my field that I am farming that are actually marginally not cost effective? Like if I just uh, didn't plant that extra 10 feet close to that waterway this year, I would actually get a better return on my entire field. And that's, that's where some of these, these tools have really been able to help turn our growers' perspective on their operational practices. Mm -hmm. so, so you're the second now that's made this point, this predictive analytics really having power. Um, has there been, but I think this ties into the communication, right? Because if you're not communicating the power effectively of what you're trying to do, for instance, um, with the, the, the parts are going to break, all right? And we know that how, how long they're going to run before they're going to break. You start saying we're going to be distributing parts, you know, et cetera. Is, is there any pushback from uh, end users or, or consumers of your, of your products, your, your data, your tools that you have, have overcome? And are there any lessons learned from that and so, sort of, or, or was it just like you were saying with your, your customers' trust that they, they, they trust this? How, how do you build that, that trust? Yeah, I mean, trust is ultimately what you have to get to, but we did have some rocky learnings along that path. Um, you know, we spent a long time working on the visualizations, trying to figure out how's the, how, what's the best way we could build it, a web page or a mobile page to deliver that story. 
Uh, we went from geospatial views, like is a map view the best way? Is a graph? Is, uh, you know, we went through ver several iterations of, of those, of that user experience. Um, and then we often would get to a point with the grower where they'd be like, well, that's, that's just not right. And, and then you kind of stuck. So then we, we then iterated and found, well, how can we tell the story that we are right? How can we make these formulas and make the calculations that we're doing much more simple to understand for the, for the growers? And when, then we, we weave that into the UX. You know, we have diagrams and, and different uh, help contexts to help the grower understand this is how we are arriving at this conclusion. And that has helped us get a lot more traction with that. Um, but it, it's, it's not easy, and, and the best way we've found to do it is to do, is to iterate, is to try something, see if that fails, try again, until you start to hit that, that sweet spot. I yeah. think that's, oh, sorry. sorry. You first. Thank you. Uh, so, yeah, I think that's a very good point about communication, especially in sort of evol evolving technological scenarios. Uh, I would say sort of, you know, it's extremely important, especially for me, I guess, to keep in mind that communication is sort of a two-way process, not just us pushing stuff out, but really listening to people and understanding what the problems are, and then also communicating that this is an evolving scenario, and you know, this is the performance right now. We want to get to whatever the end goal is, but we will get there together and figuring out, setting out expectations off the stops on the way, off the you know, issues that we, are, we know we're gonna have face and some issues that we don't even know that we're gonna face. So that's, I think, uh, you know, important to keep in mind for anybody who's involved uh, in ag tech, regardless of sort of the type of technology or mm -hmm. which part of the value chain you're in. Uh, so I think uh, that allows us to uh, much more successfully uh, reach the endpoint uh, that is mutually beneficial and uh, reach it faster. Uh, yeah, rather than just saying, hey, here's what we're doing and you know, go take it, do whatever you want. I think it's, it's interesting to, to, dis to make that distinction though, right? Because what we need to do is we need to, to you know, test, fail, learn as fast as we can in R&D and the sooner we can do that, with growers or, or you know, with our customer in a way that's, you know, to your point, transparent and saying this is a test, you know, it's a POC, we're making this better along the way, the better, right? But what we, what's, what's challenging with that is, I mean, agriculture, the decisions that, that farmers make are, are life decisions. I mean, these are, these are, I mean, I'm not a farmer, I, I don't have that personal experience, but they're, they are, this is their livelihood, right? And so making those decisions and investing in this, these technologies is really challenging. It's not you know, a, an, an app on my phone and if it breaks, oh well, I just get to delete it, no big deal, right? It was five bucks on the, you know, the Apple website, right? It, so, so I think that's, that's the distinction to make is that that, that test, learn, fail process in R&D is required, but we can't really expect our grower customers to, to do that as much you know, with, with new technology, given the, the sort of stakes that, you know, the, what's at stake in the operations that they're running. So it, it sounds like uh, we're back to the team. We, we, we potentially have UX people helping us in terms of the design and the visualization, the presentation, and then people with good communication skills to match with those deep technical skills. Is there anybody want to comment on that? Yeah, I'd say at Cargill, uh, we're very blessed too because we also have software engineers and data engineers that help us, right? So they will uh, aggregate a lot of that data. It's usually in, as we talked about, many different places, right? And bring it in and that's very important so that our data scientists can really focus on that model building. Um, and so then we also have the teams, like I mentioned, who go out and put the sensors, uh, the software engineers who bring it in, we build the models, we have the software engineers who take it off of our systems right, and get it to a place where it's useful, and then we also have teams often in the businesses that will build sort of that final step, whether it is an app or a URL or sending somebody an email or putting that insider information uh, in a place where it's part of their workflow of what they're already doing. And having that entire system work together is so important because if just one of those pieces fails, right, the entire, the entire thing fails. And so, yeah, it really does take a coordinated team effort of uh, people being nice to each other uh, and working together to try and make it uh, try and make it a success. I believe Kelly said it was a village, right? so <laughs> it does take a lot. Yeah. Chris, did you have something? Yeah, no, I would say 
I would agree with everything that was said, but I think we, we're missing a key component of this, which is how do you get to the point of where you identify the need to develop something, which is the customer. I mean, ultimately, it goes back to understanding your market. We've talked about this a lot. How do, how do you utilize your customer base to understand what it is, what products that, ne that they need to fill a gap? Ultimately, none of these, these features or products that any of us are looking to provide mean anything unless they solve a problem for a customer. They solve a problem or they provide potential for ROI. So understanding what that is going into it before you even get to any of those steps, I think is probably the most critical piece. Okay. All right, so uh, as promised, we're opening this up to questions. Um, I do want to make a point that I've been paying attention and most questions have been coming from the center. So the left and right sides, uh, you need to start pulling your weight. Are there any questions? Ah, we have one here, yes. So, uh, um, scalability is something I haven't heard discussed yet, and scalability um, in, uh, as for me, I'm, I'm more from, a, I've grew up in the pharmaceutical, biopharmaceutical, after my farming agricultural experience, but, and, um, you know, when you're going from the bench level to the, uh, to a pilot level and, and eventually getting to commercialization, scalability is a, is a big issue. Um, on the other hand, um, a new technology area from a macro standpoint, let's say when biopharmaceuticals were developed, going uh, from one type of a product, one product to across the whole platform of products that could potentially be developed, scalability has a, has a whole other set of issues. And since digital agriculture seems to be a relatively new field, I'm wondering whether any of you have any experiences in terms of how do you take what you've done and scale it so that it's applicable to the whole population of people who might be using it? And also, how do you take um, the AI and the digital agriculture and apply that across the whole industry? And I, you know, that, so I think from going from an infancy to, uh, to a mature uh, requires that. I think about my own experience and it requires a lot of, of planning and a lot of forward thinking um, and, uh, and, and a lot of hard work in order to get to that point of being scalable. So I'm just open it up to the panel in terms of scalability of, of digital agriculture. I'll just say just quickly, you know, we're starting to tackle that in the last two years at the bank globally and building out data infrastructures around the world and it's really changed the business model of the bank where the countries were working fairly independently as financial institutions and the recognition that we ultimately we have to bring that data together over the next few years and so it's a it's a five to seven year time horizon to build an infrastructure have the right systems to collect the data internally and then to marry that with a lot of external data so I agree with your point it's it's really challenging uh, but and it, it takes a while to solve. I would say the thing to think about is that the scalability, in, and in my mind, scalability is synonymous almost with durability and efficiency, it needs to be sort of like step two, or well, a later step, whether it's two or not, <laughs> right, a later step of the process. So from an innovation standpoint, I like to think about, you know, you have an idea and you need to create a proof of concept. Probably that proof of concept is going to be expensive, you know, you're maybe going to have more sensors on it or, or it's going to be sort of overbuilt. Right? But, but you've demonstrated that you have something and you think you can, you, you can deliver value with it. You know, I think then thinking about, okay, what are the really core components or how do I make this durable or how do I, how do I make this more efficient or, or cheaper, right, in a dollar sense actually, um, is, is a whole separate phase. And you, it's a really sort of different way of thinking about the product or the, it's a, it is innovation, um, but it's sort of a different kind of innovation um, that to your point is, is maybe not always a well appreciated sort of step of the process. So make it work and then make it scale. Yes. And, and I guess from our augmented mixed reality perspective, that was something we considered right away. And so when we went down this project, we picked maybe three or four different ways we could utilize that technology. And then as we were evaluating them, we've kind of came to one that we actually, based on our systems, think is scalable. And it's something that we, you know, based on, okay, how much technical expertise are the people using this going to need to have? Um, and then, um, you know, is it something we could distribute out through our dealer network? 
uh, so that they could create you know, their own experiences. And so um, that was, at least in our journey, part of the, our decision making. Yeah, I think uh, scaling is always going to be a very tough challenge, specifically in agriculture, because it's a large, complex, very heterogeneous system. You know, agriculture, let's say just corn, growing corn in Wisconsin versus growing it in Texas are, you know, entirely different kinds of uh, problems that you're trying to solve. Uh, but if you create a meaningful solution to a critical problem, the scaling is going to at least become easier slightly because there is a pull from the market rather than you trying to you know, actively push against all these barriers that are in place anyway and then there isn't a, a clear demand from the end user. So I think that's you know, the way we approach it is let's figure out what the core problems are and then uh, you know, as the pull becomes uh, a natural draw to the technology into the marketplace, we will have to still overcome the tough challenges, but at least it's worthwhile then to overcome them. Do we have another question? Hello, uh, my name's Anthony. I'm CEO of a Purdue-based startup called Progeny. And my question's mainly for uh, Chinmay and Kelly. I'm really interested in people who are trying to use drones for outdoor small plot research. And I wonder if you two can talk about why that uh, is often so difficult, expensive, and slow right now. All right, <laughs> I can start. Um, so it's okay. So it's difficult, slow, and not maybe taking off for your questions. Those okay. So it is, I think, taking off. I think what we're what our challenge is the the basically the data pipeline. Right, and so I think we've talked about cell connectivity and wireless connectivity in, in really rural the US, let alone the globe, right? So when you start to think about you know, doing UAVs in Africa or doing UAVs in South America, India, you know, all the places that we operate globally as Bayer, that just becomes a, a massive problem. So that, that data, getting an image to a you know, number in, in a you know, database is, is a very big challenge. And that goes back to scalability. Yeah, I think uh, what I would add is when there is enough demand for the data, people are using drones, right? I mean, people have been using satellites, people have been using drones uh, since, I don't know, 2013 at least, there have been significant uh, use of drones in high-end agricultural product development, crop development, all that kind of stuff. Uh, so I would say it is, uh, working to the extent where people value that data and can afford to pay for it. But there are all these sort of second tier uh, seed companies or CROs or academic researchers and all those kinds of people who would like to have the data but uh, do not have an easy enough solution. And then from our perspective, so our background technically is also in drones and uh, aerial uh, robots basically. Uh, but one of the bottlenecks there is there's only so much you can tell about a crop uh, from the air, uh, not to mention all the regulatory and operational logistical issues that come in with having robots in the air versus robots on the ground. So that's, you know, personally our pivot towards more the ground robotics was driven by both of those things that the uh, key bottleneck is under canopy data and then uh, it's also a lot easier when you don't have to uh, keep getting FAA clearance and have line of sight and all those kinds of issues, right? All right. So I know we've got another question on the left side. I just want to tell the people on the right, you're slacking off. We need some questions over here, too. Go ahead. You'll have to forgive me. I've been out of the, the room, so I don't know that you've covered this, but I, maybe not. Uh, on data collection, as it relates to marketing grain at, and Cargill and Bravo. So Bravo has recently, in the last I don't know, six months, written an article about how the data collection, maybe field to market, some of those other things, might be able to allow uh, the end user to be able to reach all the way around the ABCDs, uh, the Cargills and ADMs of the world, uh, to market directly to the end user uh, for regular commodity agriculture. And I'm wondering how Cargill's dealing with that or thinking about it. Uh, something, and if you, I heard a term this past week called mass balance from ADM. 
and I want to know whether you know whether that is, and what Robbo thinks about how this all works in the, in the marketing system for commodity agriculture. Go ahead, Robert. <laughs> uh, certainly not the, the expert on a topic. I'll, I'll tell you, I think, um, definitely if you just look at the consumer trends um, with more traceability, look at the scale of agricultural production, I think you know, the collapsing value chains, there, there's more and more of that. I mean, we have our larger clients. You know, they're either much more vertically integrated into their operations, uh, production, and, you know, out to food products, or they are able to go directly to, you know, the larger food companies and direct contract. So I think that's going to happen. I think, it, but it's not a, you know, I think agriculture is quite large and diverse, and there's, there's going to be a place, I think, but it's recognizing that there's going to be more fragmentation in in the value chain and collapsing in certain areas, particularly as it gets closer to the consumer or a specialty identity preserve crop. Oh, I'll go next. Uh, absolutely, right, Cargill? Uh, we're thinking about this. Um, and uh, there, there are a couple of things that we're doing, right? It used to be that information was uh, sort of not available, right? Now it's becoming available to everyone, which is opening up these new and different channels. And agriculture is not going to be immune to it, just like every other industry wasn't immune to it. And so certainly at Cargo, we're looking at ways. So uh, one of the things that, uh, as part of sustainability that we think about, right, is farmer livelihoods and farmer prosperity. And as Lena put it very well earlier from AgCo, she said, you know, we do well when our, when our farmers do well. Uh, and so that's something that we're always thinking about and, and right now have a number of projects going on to uh, assist uh, farmers with that. It's a great question. Um, sort of the equivalent in e-commerce of direct-to-consumer, right? But now we're flipping it around, pulling from the consumer straight to the market. Um, Maybe one thing I'll just comment on that that I, I saw in Europe um, where you, you see the some of the food companies and they want to work directly with the producer. So I think of you know, uh, some of the protein or retail companies in Europe where they want to know the carbon footprint of the beef operations where they're sourcing from, and so they want to, they want to work directly with those operations. Uh, so there's different reasons why that's happening, uh, but it, it, at, a, at a minimum, the data transparency has to be there. Another question. So one of the things that, that actually Robert made, made me remember this point, um, it's not just because we share a name, uh, is that we sort of get a little myopic here in East Central Illinois thinking about ag being corn and soybeans and then maybe livestock, uh, and even that's limited. Uh, but, of course, there's all of the fruits and vegetables that, that we all enjoy, uh, and not to mention, as Kelly was mentioning, the global globalization aspects. Um, I wonder if, if some of the panelists might want to talk to that point, that globalization point, um, and then thinking more broadly about soil, about equipment, uh, about the data that we're collecting, and how is that different for different types of products, uh, different types of product lines, or in different parts of the world? Rebecca? Sure, I can take it. Uh, Cargill is, of course, a global company. I joked before about packing up the hard drives from Canada. That was Canada. Uh, we also want to get information from the jungles, uh, from our, plant, our palms uh, plantations in Indonesia, right? Uh, think of the challenges of that just compared to a farm in Canada, which should be relatively much more advanced. And so these are, these are problems that we face all the time in cargo, right? Or uh, that there are folks in Brazil that are growing the crops that we want, and they have impassable roads, or we have poultry that needs to be delivered in Costa Rica. Um, and how do, we, how do we utilize our trucks best for that, right, so that our carbon footprint is the smallest. Um, so uh, we don't have all of the answers to this right now. There's certainly going to be technological advances uh, that will help us and that we want to take advantage of, but it's something that we struggle with all the time at Cargo. I think one of the things to keep in mind, um, and this actually brings up a conversation Frank Dolman and I were having at lunch today, about some of the climate apps and how they're being used differently in the U.S. compared to how they're being used with small shareholder farmers in India, right? And so it's it's largely a very similar um, software platform, but the needs in the market are very different. You know, when you think about the sort of large multi-acre, you know, single row crop or you know, well, corn soy, you know, rotation row crop in the U.S. compared to the 
you know, variety of, of crops that are grown in, you know, less than, or, or on average about half a hectare, you know, tiny, well, tiny compared to what we're used to, <laughs> farms in India. And so, you know, the apps, that, the, the Field View app, which the name of which in India I can't remember off the top of my head, but really essentially what that's doing is, is it's, it's more, you know, kind of a recommendation or, or when should you be planting things, you know, more of a look into the environment. Um, it's sort of a social media aspect. It's connecting farmers um, because they don't, they don't have that as, as easily as we do in the U.S. And so I think it also, you know, it depends. There, there's really different markets and different challenges that farmers have um, globally. And so, you know, if, you're, if you have a really cool solution that you think works in your space. Um, it might work in another space, but you might need to tweak it and, and really think about what the market need is in different um, countries. That actually kind of goes back to Mr. Moore's point about scalability when we think about scaling around the world. Yeah. Uh, so we're almost out of time. Uh, so I'm going to, uh, we have so many panelists, I can't give them all 30 seconds. Uh, so I'm just going to say maybe five, 10 seconds that one thing that you think is your, the number one pain point, okay? And since, since we normally start this way, I'm going to start at the far end uh, with Robert. Uh, and, you know, for me, I would just simply say, it, it's, listening to this, clearly data um, uh, collection and, and, and bringing the data together in formats that make sense is, is clearly a problem. So why don't you go ahead and start, Robert, uh, with what you think. Yeah, I think the, gr the greatest challenge is bringing, I think, and the panel talked about it, the, the multitude of data sources together. If that's, you know, imagery data, infield data, business financial data, um, and together into one platform to better enable decision making. Yeah. For us it's scale, uh, and we're trying to throw both bodies at it, uh, more data scientists and also technology, but it's tough. Uh, getting the data uh, that you need to make a decision, uh, where you need it, and when you need it. Uh, talent, so we're competing against you know, Google, Amazon, Uber, all those kinds of people uh, for solving these important problems versus just going creating an app. Understand your market again. Know, understand that the data that, that you're analyzing and, and making visible to a customer has to provide some sort of solution. It has to provide some sort of ROI. I would say it's the interdisciplinary nature of what we're trying to do. A data scientist alone, an engineer alone, a physiologist or an agronomist alone aren't going to solve the problems of the future and we need to work together. I'd say motivation, understanding what drives our customers to, to ensure that their data quality and their usage of our tools is, is optimized. Great. I, I think this last part here was fantastic. <laughs> it's a bunch of, it wasn't marketing slogans, it was very powerful statements. I really appreciate that. So why don't we thank our panelists again. Thank you.